Tonight's talk explores an exhibition currently on view at the Whitney Museum of American Art. It's called Labyrinth of Forms, Women and Abstraction, 1930 to 1950. Women were key figures and leaders in the rise of American abstract movements, particularly in print media. You may remember our exhibition and curator's talk with Christina Weil on the women of print, the, excuse me, the female printmakers of Atelier 17 this past fall. Tonight, we center the significant yet often overlooked contributions of the women artists working and innovating during this time. Our presenter this evening is Sarah Humphreyville, Senior Curatorial Assistant at the Whitney Museum, where she has worked on exhibitions since 2013, most recently as the organizer of Labyrinths of Forms. Sarah holds an MA from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, for which she completed a thesis on Edward Hopper and Dan Slavin. She received a BA, summa cum laude, in art history and a BFA in painting with a minor in drawing from Cornell University in 2009. In addition to working for the Whitney, Sarah has previously been employed by the Jewish Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and galleries in New York and Los Angeles. Without any further hesitation, I am pleased to turn it over to Sarah Humphreyville. Sarah, take it away. All right, thanks very much, Allison, and um, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining me for this talk this evening. I'm um, excited to share more about um, the show and the research that went into it with you. Um, so as Allison said, tonight's talk is um, based on the work that went into the current exhibition at the Whitney Labyrinth of Forms, Women in Abstraction, 1930 to 1950. Um, the exhibition is drawn from the Whitney's collection and features a little over 30 works by 27 female artists. It's on view until March 13th, so if you haven't yet had a chance to go to the museum and are in or find yourself in New York, I'd really encourage you to come. Um, the exhibition and tonight's talk will really um, explore the formal, conceptual, and technical impact that women had on the evolution of American abstraction in these two decades. So just to back up a little bit, though, to really kind of ground what, um, what these artists weren't doing in, in what they're doing, um, you know, now abstraction is something that we really take for granted as a valid artistic approach, but in the 1930s and 1940s, it was really, um, really something quite radical, something off, off the mainstream, and especially to be pursuing this type of art as a woman was a really radical endeavor. You know, realism, um, which we can see a couple examples of here by John Stuart Curry and Edward Hopper, was really the dominant um, dominant force stylistically, you know, whether or not it was social realism, regionalism, something more, um, you know, mood provoking like Hopper. Um, but really that, that meant that the museums and galleries really largely ignored American abstract art and the critics in particular really, really quite reviled it and um, didn't really treat it as, as something legitimate. So for the women artists, they're, you know, they're entering this profession too, that men really, really dominate and they have to contend with sexism and the era's, era's societal expectations in addition to these compounded layers of marginalization from being an abstract artist and being an American abstract artist. So there's really three things that are working against them. And you know, really within their professional realm, oftentimes they weren't taken seriously by their, by their male peers and counterparts. They, as a result, you know, did things like you know, signed their names or, or changed them even to um, disguise their gender identity. So we can see that in the detail on the left here of an Irene Rice Pereira drawing where she leaves out her first name and just uses the initial I. And it wasn't that she, you know, completely hid the fact that she was a woman, but it did, you know, it did kind of help a little bit. Um, there's also an artist known as Dora Bothwell, who we'll see later in the presentation, who changed her first name legally from Doris to Dor because she felt like it was an obstacle to entering into juried exhibitions. Um, the women also faced, you know, really gendered dynamics at, at home as it came to balancing a professional career with what were the more traditional responsibilities of a woman of being a wife and, and mother. And, you know, especially even with the artists who married other artists, they often had to play second fiddle to those husbands' careers. And to give just one example of some of the um, you know, prevailing attitudes and struggles that these women had to contend with, 
Um, Alice Trumbull Mason, who we see a photograph of here on the right, actually halted her artistic practice from 1930 to 1935 so that she could focus um, her attention on raising her children. And, you know, she was, you know, she, she did that voluntarily and out of necessity, but, um, but really did um, struggle with it and even despair about it. And she in 1934 wrote um, a really telling letter to her sister, which I'll just quote a bit from. And she said, maybe you think intellectual life is not the real thing, but damn it, just caring for babies isn't either. I'm chafing to get back to painting. And of course it's at least a couple of years away. The babies are adorable and terribly interesting. I'm not saying anything against them, but I don't want to, I can't be absorbed just in them, even though they won't be babies for very long. So within this context then, and especially for women artists, how did abstraction come to flourish in the US and, and why were so many women drawn to it? And I think, you know, on the latter point, abstraction really provided women artists in particular with an aesthetic freedom. There wasn't, wasn't a prescribed way of thinking about abstraction. People didn't even think about abstraction really much at all. So there wasn't a set way of doing things or any sort of um, preconceived notions around what women within that realm should be doing. Whereas within realism, there was definitely an idea that there were subjects that were appropriate for women to um, depict in their art, you know, particularly things like still lives of flowers or um, paintings of others with their children and that that sort of thing. This is um, something that the artist Pearl Fine called the oppressive particularities of, of realism. Um, I think abstraction more broadly going beyond the point of gender attracted a number of artists in this country because they really saw it as a new art form that would better express the new age that they were all finding um, themselves in, that this was an art that felt, um, felt appropriate to the era of urbanization and great technological change and um, that it, it, it really felt, felt exciting and felt compatible with that, um, with that world. But then there's also a few really major shifts that happen um, in this country that really enable American artists to learn about um, trends in European avant-garde art in an immediate way and at home without traveling that they didn't have available before. So there's a real shift in the cultural landscape in New York in the late 1920s as um, new spaces start to open up that are showing um, European modernism. So, you know, most famously probably MoMA opens in 1929 and you see on the right here an installation view of their um, their inaugural exhibition on Cezanne, Gauguin, Seurat, and Van Gogh. And then the um, Gallatin, A.E. Gallatin's Gallery of Living Art opened at NYU just a couple years before that in 1927. And that space I think held particular importance because of its location in Greenwich Village. It's near where a lot of the artists could live. Um, but Gallatin, who himself was also an artist as well as an, a collector and patron, also really understood the needs of artists and that they you know, weren't necessarily going to be able to make it to the galleries during regular hours. And so he'd sometimes keep the space open until 10 p.m. to ensure that um, the community of artists local to the area could come in and, and learn about what, um, what was going on <clears throat> in Europe and what he was collecting. And then the final um, organization that opens during this period is the Societe Anonyme, which was founded by Man Ray and Marcel Duchamp and Catherine Dreyer in 1920. And they had permanent spaces at some point, but, um, but really they were known for having exhibitions at a variety of different spaces in New York, as well as elsewhere. And you see on the left here, um, an installation shot from probably their most important show, which was held at the Brooklyn Museum in 1926 and featured um, you know, artists from all across Europe working in a variety of different styles. Um, the Societe also organized lectures and did writings and really Catherine Dreyer is the driving force behind this group. Man Ray really wasn't too involved after its founding and, and Duchamp's um, daily involvement in the group kind of petered out after about a year. And so within all these contexts too, I think one important thing to keep in mind is that um, 
unlike being in Europe as if they had been had been there for decades and are kind of seeing one trend come after another, one movement come after another, American artists are confronting all of this art at the same time. So they're kind of um, exposed to decades worth of modernism all at once. And I think that has the effect of them then, you know, individually kind of taking, taking what's useful and what appeals to them um, from a variety of different sources and then incorporating it into their own practices and really um, figuring out what is most useful to them and what will best um, kind of convert what they have seen into something that is more appropriate to American art. So as I mentioned, Catherine Dreyer was one of the co-founders and the, the main, um, main force behind the Societe Anonyme, but she, like A. Gallatin, was also an artist. And um, part of her, you know, her real drive to establish the Societe Anonyme and engage with its activities was that she saw the, quote, urgent need in the art world for people to acquaint themselves with the latest movements in modern painting and sculpture. So, you know, she really, she really gets that. Um, that not that there's not just a desire or curiosity, but a real need for American artists to understand what is being done across the Atlantic in order for them to really best situate themselves within a broader international conversation. And, and that was something that she was um, very much engaged in. And as an artist, Dreyer had, um, you know, had had a lot of training, including in Europe. She initially began by making um, works that were quite reminiscent of Whistler, but by 1918, she had started working abstractly. Um, she was informed by a lot of the European artists that she collected and knew. Um, Kandinsky was probably the most important influence on her work, but, but really for that first decade that she's working abstractly from 1918 until 1929, she's, she's still kind of figuring things out. And then by 1929, she really kind of enters her own and starts making what we would call um, her mature work. And I think part of that is actually that she has more time to devote to her artwork when her finances take a bit of a downturn with the arrival of the Great Depression. Um, you know, she was still, still well off and, and comfortable and, and everything like that, but didn't have quite as much capital to invest into exhibition making and art collecting. But that in turn gave her time to really focus on what she was doing. And one of the works that is um, that she makes, you know, shortly after arriving at her mature style is a portfolio of prints called 40 Variations, which this is an example from. And it's a kind of strange approach to making a print. You know, we think of printmaking oftentimes as being something really well suited to reproduction and, and being about that kind of idea of exact replication. And Dreyer really turned that on its head with these, with these works. So it's a lithograph combined with watercolor and each print in the series uses the lithograph as the basis, uh, the sort of armature of the, of the print and that those black lines that you see are, are lithographs. But then each one she went back into with primary colors in watercolor and each print within the series became a variation so that the placement of those colors would be different from print to print, or even the proportions of you know that yellow stripe in the center um, in the large circle would be different from print to print. So she's really um, you know, really having fun with it and really playing with um, with that idea of printmaking being just about reproduci re reproducibility and really taking a creative approach to it. And that concept of the print sort of expanding beyond it. And it's important that it's also lithograph expanding beyond that was really seen as a commercial medium at this time. Um, she actually inspires um, friends and fellow artists to then think about her print within the context of their own medium. And her friend, Ted Sean choreographed a dance to um, inspired by the print. And you can see an example of another variation blown up here when the dance was performed in 1939. And then another friend, um, Jess Meeker, composed a score to go with it. And you can see too um, here how the dancer's costumes are also inspired by the formal language in her, in her work. So at the same time that these new venues for abstraction are opening, um, avant-garde minded teachers also come to teach in New York's art schools. 
And um, that might be familiar to this audience in particular tonight, since the Art Students League was one of the key places where this was happening. And the teachers, Jan Matulka, Vakla Vitlachil, who you see here on the left, and Hans Hoffman, who you see in the right, all came to teach the League between 1928 and 1932. Um, Arshel Gorky, who um, may be familiar to people through his later abstract expressionist work also was teaching at the Grand Central School of Art at this time. He was there from 1926 to 31. He also spent a lot of time just kind of socializing and flitting about the league and making his presence um, felt there. And then Hoffman also set up his own school in New York in 1934 and in Provincetown in 1935. And these teachers are really um, teaching formal modern art principles really for the first first time in teaching people not just how to make something, how to replicate from life, but also really how to think as an artist. So to just show one example of how we see that, um, that educational um, background impacting somebody's work, we can look to this drawing um, of oil on paper called Still Life by Lee Krasner. Um, Krasner had studied at a variety of schools in New York, including the Art Students League, um, but then in 1937, started taking classes with Hans Hoffman at his, um, at his own school. And one of the things that Hoffman really um, emphasized in his teaching was the importance of negative space. And, you know, I think that's something that even people who are not, um, who are not artists, who aren't, you know, even really ever taking an art class certainly have an idea of, of what that is. And, and you know, could even come up with a basic definition, but it was a really kind of radical concept for that time. And you know, Hoffman emphasized the pushing and pulling of shapes um, within that negative space and against each other. And that's an idea that Krasner really took and ran with, and which we see so beautifully executed in this work. And you know, were it not for the title "Still Life," I think we'd consider this you know something that was even really a pure abstraction. And and this work is certainly much more abstract than the art that Hoffman was making at this time. But of course, one of the key features of this work is that the paper, so much of it is left blank, that that, um, that white of the sheet really becomes not just a support, but a compositional element, that it, it's dynamically interacting with all these wonderful pops of colors as the colors also play against each other in these kind of shard-like um, shapes. So you, you see her really not, not just internalizing the lessons that she learns in the class, but then taking it and making her, it her own and using it to um, advance what um, an idea of abstraction can be. So as American artists are starting you know, to kind of have a few things in place that are teaching them about abstraction, pushing their work in that direction and getting them excited about it, you know, they're confronted with the fact that they still don't really have a place to exhibit, which is of course, um, you know, kind of the key, key goal in, in becoming an artist. You know, these new spaces that had opened up really were dedicated primarily to European art with very, very few exceptions. And the Whitney Museum, which had opened right around the same period, um, was founded in 1930 and opened to the public in 1931, was yes, devoted to American art, but was really very much embedded within this realist tradition and didn't, didn't really show or collect abstract art for the most part. So within that set of circumstances, and a lot of these artists had also started to get to know each other through, through schools, also importantly through the WPA, which had really given them a sense too of professional esteem that they were being acknowledged as professionals, as workers, and importantly for the women, were also getting paid the same amount for doing the same work as men. Um, so that there's, you know, there's definitely a sense of community that's really, really brewing and, and these, these um, organizations are obviously overlapping with each other too. So in 1936, there really starts to become, you know, an urgent sense that exhibitions um, need to take place. And by late in the year, the, um, the artists coalesce to form a group that they call the American Abstract Artists. And they're founded on the principle of a quote, liberal in interpretation of of the word abstract, which is really, really critical that, you know, unlike in Europe where you kind of have these very defined movements with manifestos, you have friendships sometimes breaking up over the use of a diagonal line within a composition. 
Um, there weren't enough abstractionists for the Americans to really fracture over aesthetic principle, and they recognized that there was um, there was strength in numbers, and so they um, they incorporate all sorts of styles into their group. And from the start, women also played a really really prominent role in the organization. Um, they were about um, 25% of the founding membership. Um, nine of the founding members, nine of the 39 founding members, were women. And very quickly, the group um, succeeds in its ambition to stage an exhibition um, just a few months after forming in April 1937. They held this gallery that you see and this exhibition that you see um, an installation shot of at what they termed the Squib Galleries, which was space they'd rented in an office building called the Squib Building. So, you know, what we would call a pop up today. And it was really just as you can see in that caption open for just two weeks. Um, but it was an opportunity for them to get the art out to the public, which they then enhanced by creating a portfolio that people could buy when they came to the show. Um, they um, ended up selling about 500 copies of this portfolio. So it really did the job of generating a little bit of money for the group, but also really being an effective marketing tool at this kind of aim of getting the gospel of abstraction out into the world. And just as the women members participated in the founding, they were prominently featured in the portfolio. Um, 30 of the founders um, made work for the, for the portfolio and seven of the nine women did. And you can see those seven prints installed in the Whitney's gallery here. And I think this, this arrangement also does such a great job of showing off the real diversity of styles that um, had taken seed within the group that you see in the bottom here this you know, quite cool mechanical um, composition by Gertrude Green or more biometric or biomorphic abstraction in the top right by Alice Trumbull Mason. And then something that really resembles a sort of blind contour drawing by Marie Kennedy in the center on the top. And that, those are all incorporated within, um, within the same group. And so despite the show really getting negative reviews from the press, you know, there wasn't, wasn't any different treatment of them than there had been before, except for that they actually had gotten notice, but they were pretty much dismissed as, um, as decorative and derivative or disconnected from reality. The, the group considered the show a success. Obviously, they sold um, a lot of copies of that print portfolio. They also had about 1,500 visitors within a two-week um, period. And that success was recognized by their fellow artists who um, were working abstractly in some cases. And that really spurred new membership for the group. And one of the people who joined, it was Irene Rice Pereira, who we saw um, a detail of a detail of this, this drawing earlier in the presentation. And Pereira was someone who actually had had um, quite a bit of success in the art world before joining the group. Um, she is yet another student who studied at the Art Students League. She was um, one of Jan Matulka's students and really um, really felt that she learned a lot about, um, about modernism from, from him and found his classes tremendously important for that, but also in building um, a whole network of artists um, to correspond with and share ideas with. And she had actually had a solo show in New York by 1933. So just, you know, within five years, you know, for her to be kind of coming into the group was real, I think, boon for the organization or certainly spoke a lot. And 1938 was also a year that she shifted in her practice from um, making modern work that was really inspired by machines and ships to making work like you see here where geometric planes dominate. And you can see within this shallow space, this kind of um, sense of competing planes and this sense of overlapping and intersecting and also a real, real interest in, in texture and how light is also playing within her composition, which, um, you know, the, all the different kinds of mark making really contribute to that sense here. And in her painting practice, she was actually using a whole variety of different materials, um, some of them quite experimental and very unusual to have in fine art, but they really helped her um, think about her ideas about the relationship between time and space and light. And she actually said that space time was her medium. Another artist who joined the group a few years after its founding was Charmian von Wiegand. And we see, um, see an early drawing from her here. She's 
um, probably better known for her more grid-like compositions from the mid-1940s on, which were really inspired by Mondrian, but in the um, time period that she had met Mondrian, she actually felt like meeting him was so impactful that she needed to kind of take a beat with her painting, but she continued her drawing practice and did automatic drawings like these ones and would do hundreds of them, but then pick out certain ones for further development with gouache and collage elements. Um, but like Catherine Dreyer, um, Von Wiegen wore a number of hats within the art world. So she too was not just an artist, but she was also a writer. And importantly, she was actually the only critic who gave the inaugural show of the American Abstract Artists a positive review. She wasn't yet a member then, so she could go into it without bias, but she really um, sought to understand this art on its own terms and saw that it wasn't just simply derivative of, um, of European practice. And as her writing continued throughout the, um, throughout the 30s and into the early 40s, she's really one of the people um, laying the foundation for the fact that abstraction can be a political act and is really helping to get um, the idea of a Marxist approach to art history set up. And, and her writing um, is really then preparing American audiences to start understanding and therefore accepting abstraction and her work alongside the continual annual exhibitions of the American abstract artists, which start to also be accompanied by, um, by catalogs that they called yearbooks and, and women importantly were contributors to these, to these catalogs. Um, that really begins to, to spark a change with how abstraction is being received here. And even critics that had been against abstraction before at least um, at least acknowledged that abstraction was here to you know was here to stay as the New York Times critic said he said you know it wasn't just a flash in the pan and you start to get a younger generation of arts writers too who are more willing to engage with this material. The 1940s also see a number of additional spaces um, open to modern art opening so the Museum of Non-Objective Painting which becomes the Guggenheim opens, you also see galleries like the Nierendorf Gallery in Pinateca, the Willard Gallery, Betty Parsons, which is probably the best known today, um, certain venues that are really dedicated to prints in particular, like Wittenborn and Schultz, and then of course, um, Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century, which you see a photograph of the abstract gallery um, here. And, and Peggy Guggenheim also importantly devoted a couple shows just to women artists in 1943 and 1945. So did, you know, did recognize their voices, even as she, you know, kind of um, awkwardly tread into that terrain. But ironically, even within this context of a more, um, a more broad acceptance of abstraction, or at least a growing acceptance of one, the influence of the American abstract artists began to wane. I think some of it is that there's, you know, more, more voices out there, but there also began to be a perception that their approach rather than being this liberal interpretation of the word abstract had actually become quite dogmatic. And by the mid forties, the group was really associated with a kind of cool, rigid geometric approach. And that, that drove certain members away from the group, including some of the founders. But the larger community of artists really remained um, committed to an experimental approach to abstraction, to pursuing a variety of techniques and styles and among the places where these communities of abstraction flourished was Atelier 17, which as Allison mentioned, the Art Students League just hosted a really wonderful exhibition about the relationship between the League and Atelier 17. Um, and <clears throat> women um, at Atelier 17 were also a really important force just as they had been um, in the American abstract artists. And there's certainly a lot of overlap between these two groups, just as there had been between the educational networks and the WPA and the American abstract artists. So um, just to back up a little bit, Atelier 17 is a print shop that first opened in Paris in the late 1920s, but with the outbreak of war came to New York in 1940 and operated here for 15 years from 1940 to 1955. And it was really a kind of laboratory for formal and technical experimentation and really introduced the idea of what a modern print could be to the United States. Um, it specialized in intaglio, which is a you know, kind of broad category of printmaking in which someone is um, carving into a plate or incising into it. Intaglio 
Italian actually means um, means carving. And they're really thinking about what the boundaries of intaglio can be and working on expanding it. And, th and that kind of technical expansion married with formal innovation is kind of what leads us to this idea of a modern print. Um, so the workshop was termed uh, the cell of a revolution by the artist Sue Fuller and their well-established European artists really worked right alongside emerging American artists and collaboration and idea sharing were really of paramount importance. And as I said, women were important contributors to the studio encompassing about 40% of the, um, of the artists working there. And for these female artists, the, their participation in the workshop, you know, and being treated and treated as peers while they were there really helped them develop their work. They were participating in the aesthetic debates that were taking around at the studio. And it also gave them the opportunity to exhibit. And that in particular really helped them develop their professional reputations that were, you know, that was difficult to do for abstract women still at this time, in spite of the advances that, um, that the 40s had seen in terms of the overall acceptance of abstraction. So to kind of um, focus in on what the um, achievements of the print shop are and how they're impacting people's work. I want to focus on just a couple of artists that were involved there. The first being Sue Fuller, who I just mentioned as describing Atelier 17 as the cell of a revolution. So Fuller starts to kind of emerge as an artist in the 1930s. And like many, um, many artists working at that time, she began her work as a social realist, which she later would um, understand as a symptom of being, um, quote, stuck in the hangover of the American scene. But then she goes to Atelier 17 in 1943, and you can see in comparing these two works by her, the one on the left from 1942 and the print concerto from 1944, just two years later, just how quickly her work changes um, having worked at that space and she you know totally pivots from a realist approach to one that is completely completely abstract and also very quickly becomes a vital force at the studio she actually took on the role of master printer which was um, a position historically reserved for men within the context of print shops um, and she was also at the forefront of the print shops technical innovations. She was really single-handedly responsible for the revival of the sugar lift printing technique. Um, it's a, an intaglio approach that allows an artist to make these kind of broad painterly passages of, um, of value or color, which is, is very difficult to achieve um, on a copper plate. It's obviously a pretty rigid, um, rigid matrix on which to work. And, and this is something that becomes adopted quickly by her peers um, at the studio, again, going to that idea of collaboration and idea sharing. And then in her own work, she's also picking up on ideas that others have really um, brought forth in advance while she's there, combining them with her own ingenuity. And she's um, oftentimes combining multiple techniques into a given print, including this one, Lancelot and Guinevere, which actually has three, three different approaches in it. And that's, you know, one of the key features of um, many Atelier 17 prints and a, and a principle of intaglio in general that you can be using multiple techniques on a single plate. So to zero in on some of those techniques and details, um, one of the advances that's happening at Atelier 17 is the concept that you can do um, print in multiple colors on the same run through the press. Um, typically in a print, you have to have different, different print runs for each color that you see down. So for Fuller in this print, she would have needed a separate run for the red and a separate run for the black, but they figured out a way um, to use stencils in order to be able to print the colors at the same time. So you'd first ink the black area as you would a normal print. Um, Fuller would make an impression of just the black and then figure out exactly where she wanted to put those colors. And then you would ended up with a result that gets this kind of really crisp um, crisp, definite edge between the two colors, which we can see so well in that arc of, of red on the left um, detail here. Um, another technique that was really forwarded by the studio was um, to think about the sculptural applications of embossing. So, you know, this is embossing in a fine art sense, not in an, um, you know, fancy imitation sort of 
sense, but you can see in the detail on the right and embossed passage really well in that sort of um, bean shape of brighter white in the center. And when you see the print in person, you see that that area isn't just brighter, but that it's actually raised. And Fuller achieved this in this print by using a technique that the studio really figured out that if you um, carved into your plate um, deeply enough, it wouldn't, uh, and widely enough, it wouldn't really hold ink when you um, when you put the black ink over the surface and then she, you know, carefully clean it out. But then when the paper, which is wet, an intaglio process would go through the press, the pressure of the press would um, make it so the paper would go down into that groove and then you'd get this sculptural form rising up. The other thing that Fuller really seized on that was, you know, kind of all over the place at Atelier 17 was the revival of the soft ground etching technique. And, it had really, you know, mostly been used for commercial purposes or, repro or at least reproductive purposes um, prior to what Atelier 17 was doing. Um, in soft ground versus traditional etching, you have a much more malleable, sticky base that you're drawing into, which made it easy to reproduce drawings through because you could more, um, more easily make a mark. But at Atelier 17, they started, you know, really making this an experimental approach. You know, what can you put into this? surface to, to make a work of art. And for Fuller, um, she used string and various forms of fabric, particularly lace to make her designs, which we can see here. So she kind of sets up this um, network of string and then combines lace into it, pulling on that lace so that it's not just, um, not just working as, you know, I pulled this out of the drawer and here it goes, but really is almost drawing with that, that fabric as she pulls on the holes and sets up her design and, and is doing that to really achieve an overall abstract effect. And then when this, this is all over the surface of the work that really creates an overall lively energized composition that goes from the edge to edge. So Fuller, um, as she's engaging with soft ground actually kind of comes up with her own technique to um, executing it where she would make a wooden frame. And then as you can see on the left would actually stretch her strings and ribbons and lace over it so that it's all um, kind of a taut design that she has control over and then she could just apply that frame down onto the soft ground. And in this example, we see on the right, um, the print that results in part from that, that impression of the, of the structure in the wooden frame. And Fuller really became so engaged with this system that she actually evolved these fabric apparatuses into sculptures um, by 1945 that she came to call um, string compositions. And these are the works that she's largely known for, but they really directly involved out of her print practice and out of the work that she'd done at Atelier 17. Um, similarly to Fuller, um, another artist whose work was really radically transformed by being at the print shop was Teresa D'Amico Forpalm, who was born in Brazil and began her artistic career in Sao Paulo, but moved to New York in 1941, where she too began taking classes at the Art Students League in her, in her case in sculpture. But by 1944, um, she moved over to Atelier 17 and her realist sculpture practice quickly gave way to making abstract prints. And you can see you know, just how, how full that pivot was in looking at this work, Rosso y Negro. And like her Atelier 17 peers, she was often combining multiple techniques into a single print. So in this detail on the left, we can see in the, um, the kind of thin black lines on the bottom that those are engraved lines. We also see in the background here in that, um, that kind of netted texture and those stripes, her use of both soft ground and aquatint. And then of course, in this black form, we see her taking on this embossing um, strategy that we just saw in Fuller, but um, Four Palm actually takes it a step further. And then once um, once she's gone um, and made her made her design, she's actually going back in and making sure that those um, those deep passages are getting ink on them. So she's forcing ink into those deep grooves that typically would have been left alone, so that she gets a raised black line rather than a raised white line. So taking that experimentation one step further. And then in the detail on the right, you see her using yet another technique to achieve a 3D effect. And here she's using open bite etching, which is a technique where a whole area, big area, broad area of the plate is left 
open to be etched by acid and that, um, you know, <laughs> such a corrosive effect that you again get these really, really deep grooves that have trouble holding onto ink, but also a bit of an element of chance, which you see in those, those bubbles with how the acid interacts with the metal. And Four Palm was really seen as um, being at the forefront of achievement in the sculptural applications of Intaglio by her peers. And actually the founder of the print shop, Stanley William Hayter, um, singled her out for achievement in this way when he um, wrote a, an important book on Intaglio strategies in the mid 1940s. So shifting gears a little bit, I would do wanna talk um, briefly about some artists who were working in abstraction in California and um, the state really sees um, some parallel activity to what's going on in terms of printmaking innovation. And I had mentioned when speaking about Catherine Dreyer that at this point, lithography was really a medium that wasn't considered to be quite in the realm of fine art and was considered something more commercial. But in Los Angeles, um, the printmaker Linton Kistler, who was a commercial lithographer, really had made an effort to get artists um, working in lithography in a fine art capacity. And among them are Elise, who you see on the right, and June Wayne. Um, Elise is one of the first artists on the West Coast to really be embracing non-objective abstraction, as we can see in this work. So that's um, you know pure abstraction, not based on nature or the real world at all. And then June Wayne, who we see on the left, had um, very similar um, conceptual ideas to Irene Rice Pereira and like her was really interested in the relationship between time and space and light and did a lot of investigation into optics, which um, was inspired by the experience of going through um, a tunnel in a freeway and seeing um, lights, headlights coming at you from the opposite directions so that, that directly inspired this work, Black Ball in a Room from 1948. And Wayne, crucially, also would become the founder of the Tamarind Workshop, which is, of course, one of the places that really ushers in a new, um, a new print renaissance in the U.S., particularly for lithography in the 1960s and beyond. Kind of similar effort was made for, on behalf of screen print by Dor Bothwell, who worked in the Bay Area. And screen print, too, was something that was really, um, really regarded as commercial, looked down upon within fine art context, but um, Bothwell happened to see an exhibition in 1943 of fine art screen prints that had been made under the auspices of the WPA um, in New York and was just totally blown away by the medium and its possibilities. And she didn't have any place to learn it on the West Coast. So she figured out um, how to teach it to herself and, um, and did so and then really dedicated herself to the medium alongside painting um, from 1943 on and um, including this work, which you can see is you know, quite layered with a number of colors. So not just taking screen print as um, you know, something that you can do something very simply with, but it's also really pushing at the boundaries of what that media can be. And I wanna um, conclude with a quote by Bothwell describing herself that I think um, you know, can equally apply to so many of the artists in the exhibition and that I've talked about tonight, but Bothwell, um, said of herself and her screen print practice, I was on the cutting edge. At one point, I was the only woman in Northern California doing this. This fits with myself and being an innovative person. And um, innovative she was and innovative were um, all of these artists. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome Lauren back so that we can answer, um, answer some of your questions. And thanks, everyone. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Really excited to jump in with some audience questions here. Um, a really interesting conversations come up in the chat. We have a couple people tuning in to say they had no idea printmaking was such a key medium in abstraction. Um, as you mentioned, Sarah, we associate printmaking with realism for a lot of its history. Uh, so I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more on printmaking significance to uh, abstract art. Um, I mean, I, lo I love that question. I didn't, didn't say it explicitly um, in tonight's talk, but you know, one of the things that I really um, feel, feel strongly about and kind of had an, you know, had an idea about before working on the show, but doing, doing research for it and assembling the exhibition and, and writing the essay that accompanies it online, I think, um, I think, you know, to, to ignore the the history of abstract printmaking is something is one of the reasons why we've had a very gendered view of abstract art mm -hmm. that um, 
you know, abstraction, I think, drew women to it because there was a certain freedom there, sort of lack of competition, a lack of market. Um, you know, those go hand in hand. But um, but printmaking, likewise, there really wasn't any market for modern prints and therefore no competition, et cetera. So I think that, you know, that adds on another layer to it, but also but also makes it perhaps a place where women are are given entry and, and permitted to sort of exist and work and and that continued even even through the 50s once you kind of get the sort of um, established market and appetite for abstract expressionism and um, you know many a number of the male artists you know big names that we um, that we know um, did make prints at Atelier 17 but I think you know it's it's by and large not those artists who are making the most um, inventive or original or interesting work that's happening there. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we're kind of in a broader moment of reevaluating the position of women within the history of abstraction and that um, as part and parcel of that, we also need to um, need to reconsider the importance of printmaking to um, abstract and modern practice in this country too. Yeah, this I'm finding this such an interesting intersection, knowing that printmaking has been largely obscured in this abstract art world. And as well, women artists working in these movements are also obscured by art history. And I'm thinking back to Christina Wiles exhibition here at the League from a couple months ago. Um, and those of you who haven't tuned into to Christina's lecture as well, it's a really fun supplement to the topics that Sarah shared with us tonight. Um, but thinking back to Christina's work with uh, Atelier 17 and women printmakers, it's so striking and auspicious to me to think that our two organizations have hosted exhibitions so recently on largely the work of female printmakers, specifically in in this era. So I'm curious if there's anything else that you would attribute that particular connection to. Why is now the moment to be sharing these works? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it's been I think it's been building for a, for a while. Um, and you know, I do have to say too that um, Christina's research was really important to my own um, own research for this um, for this exhibition and. Um, I had no idea that she was doing this show at the league. Um, really, I think it opened within a week or two of, right. <laughs> of Labyrinth of Forms. So, um, you know, once we started talking to each other, we we realized that um, that coincidence. But you know, I think with it, within the field of art history, as as well as other fields, you know, there's been um, much greater interest in kind of reevaluating the canon, um, both in terms of in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of sexuality, and and really figuring out um, how to be more inclusive and expansive, and and look at what was um, written out. And you know, on the topic of of women in abstraction, there have been I think a number of really great um, shows and books. You know, Ninth Street Women by Mary Gabriel was um, you know came out a few years ago and was really um, also a wonderful resource, but you know was really popular and. Um, the Denver Art Museum held a show on women in abstraction and or women in abstract expressionism. We've seen retrospectives at the Barbican of Lee Krasner. Um, but one, you know, one thing that I I really wanted to engage with was kind of say, okay, but what happened before abstract expressionism? We're getting a lot of attention there, but that didn't just come from from nothing. And uh, you know, what I hope um, tonight's talk and what the show does um, in part is also to really um, understand how American abstraction in the 30s and 40s, and particularly the early 40s, really does help set the stage for the acceptance of abstract expressionism and that women are really critical to that, that history. But yeah, I think, it, I think it fits within a broader, um, a broader art historical project that's not certainly not specific to um, this period or abstraction um, that's you know, really built on the legacy of the feminist art history movement beginning in the 1970s. Oh, thank you. It's so helpful to fill in some of those, those question marks there. Um, and I know that Labyrinth of Forms, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a show entirely on drawings and prints, right? There's no paintings in the show. Um, and so thinking again about these ideas, you've really covered extensively for us, you know, why are you know, women artists drawn to these uh, forms of abstraction? Is the omission of painting significant in this exhibition? Um, it's really practical just because of what the um, what the space the show is is in. Um, 
we, we can't exhibit paintings in that space, um, nor sculptures. And, you know, not most of the artists in this show created drawings and or prints alongside artworks in either one or both of those, um, those media. And, and the Whitney certainly has um, examples of their work in other, um, in other forms in certain, in certain cases. But um, yeah, the space is really is really dedicated to drawings and prints um, and sometimes photographs. But um, but it did really seem that um, that works on paper were really critical to address within this context too. So in, in thinking about what I wanted to do a show on that would also work in that space, it, it seemed um, it seemed a very apt topic um, for it. Yeah, I love that about the curatorial process that we make these design choices based on um, space and resource available. However, in so doing, we see this really interesting narrative and these interesting relationships emerge that then become part of that messaging. That's very cool. Uh, another audience question here, do you often see contemporary artists using printmaking for abstraction um, here in the year 2022? Um, so sorry, I don't know how closely you work with, you know, um, contemporary art of the moment, but how relevant do you see the medium of print today? Yeah, so I mean, I, I actually work, um, one of the hats that I wear at the Whitney is that I work with our drawing and print acquisition committee. So I, I'm working with our, um, our collection in those two media from 1900, really when the Whitney's collection kicks off up through the present day. So um, I'm definitely engaged in that material. And I think there's a lot of really exciting work being done in abstract printmaking and um you know that that like the artists in this show um you know they're not necessarily only printmakers but um you know thinking about but they're you know they're not just like necessarily making a print just to make a print either that if you think about people like um sarah z or charlene von heil um or julie moretz who you know those are, those are artists who are all um, making work in other media, but also making um, making work in print. And I think in thinking about Julie's work in particular, and you know, I loved that the Whitney show that was recently held um, really showcased this. That you you really see a dialogue between printmaking practice and painting practice, and that there's you know kind of um, sense of excavation and and mutual um, informing that happens happens there. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, of really vital um, abstract printmaking um, being done by, by women and, and men as well, and, and also non-binary artists. I'm going to shift slightly into um, a question about your own scholarship. Um, for those of us tuning in who may be emerging researchers, uh, knowing that you did some academic work and wrote your thesis um, in part on Hopper, I'm curious how you found yourself transitioning from um, American realism into uh, what is now a focus on abstraction, or is that just for this particular exhibition for now? Yeah, I don't. I don't really see um, there necessarily being a, a real divide between thinking about realism and, and thinking about um, abstraction and, you know, other, other exhibitions that I've worked on at the Whitney have been, um, have been grounded in realism and, and abstraction, both. I've done a lot of work on the 1930s. Yeah. Um, so certainly Hopper is, is part of, of that. Um, I, I really actually started in graduate school um, with a much more contemporary focus. The first first paper I wrote was on Christian Markley's clock. So I <laughs> um, transitioned from contemporary video um, to, you know, 19, 1930s prints. Um, but, um, but, you know, I think, I think the idea of how to approach each work on its individual terms, think about it in the context of that time, you know, that, that carries over, but, um, but certainly I've become, you know, more of a historian than a contemporary scholar and, um, but, you know, I, I was one of the organizers of the Vita Americana show, which was pretty much all, almost all realist work, although Pollock, um, early Pollock works were in there, some Scaris's work is more abstract. Um, I also was one of the organizers of the Grant Wood show, which is, you know, really the antithesis of what you see here. Um, but before that, I was working on Stuart Davis, who was one of the real um, champions of abstract practice in the 30s. So, um, you know, I think this show grew out of really an understanding, a deep understanding of the of the period and, and what was going on with it, as well as, you know, an understanding that there is um, 
a lot of work to be done on this on this topic that has been neglected and and also thinking about what you know what I want to see and what I can bring um, to and I've, I've certainly held um, a deep interest in in historical women artists for a long time. Yeah, that's a really exciting approach just to let ourselves be kind of governed by the, the zeitgeist and, and see how many and how diverse work is um, that's all happening in the same decade or few decades. Um, I'm going to end with a, a audience question that kind of takes us back to the beginning of this conversation, uh, returning to this idea of how surprised and delighted uh, a lot of us tuning in are to learn of these works, um, these print abstract works that we're not so familiar with, um, have these prints been made into a book that is available anywhere? Um, I'll jump into that and say, um, what are some resources you might suggest uh, where people can go to kind of continue learning more about this? Um, well, I think I think a couple of them have actually already come up. Um, Christina Wiles' book, um, The Women of Atelier 17, is, is a really fantastic resource and is um, both scholarly and highly readable at once, which is really just like the perfect, um, perfect sort of marriage. Um, Mary Gabriel's book is really more focused on, on painting, but is certainly um, a really, um, a really great source of, of learning, not just about these artists work, but really about their lives and the kind of um, the social milieu of, of the day and, and the networks that were involved. Um, I've also, as a shameless plug, written an essay in conjunction with the show, and um, uh, it's it's pretty short. It's online. It's accessible without um, you know without a credit card. <laughs> so it's um, it's free and out there. Um, and you know, there's obviously citations in there. I mean, I, I did read. I will say a lot of oral histories of you know historical um, historical reviews that are a paragraph. <laughs> long um, dissertations and that sort of thing. Um, I would say, you know, as a final, Susan Larson is a real um, scholar on the American abstract artists. Um, uh, she wrote a really fantastic dissertation, which, um, you know, it's, not like it's readily available, but um, also has contributed to various exhibition catalogs um, over the years. So I think, you know, seeking out her work is helpful, but um, but yeah, the, the show is really a marriage of a lot of um, a lot of different things and also really looking into the, the prints and drawings of people that are largely considered painters, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very good biography of Irene Rice Pereira. You know, there, there's there's yeah. a good biography of Pearl Fine. Um, yeah, absolutely. I love that there are primary sources that you're able to take directly from. I mean, this was, you know, these this is still relatively modern, close, close to contemporary uh, relationships that you're covering here. So uh, the information is, is right there at our fingertips, very exciting. Um, and that's a great place um, for us to conclude for the evening. Um, I wanna say thank you again to Sarah Humphreyville uh, for sharing this talk tonight. Uh, this is a shameless plug of our own. I assure you this final question was a real question, but in fact, we do have ongoing book sales for Ninth Street Women and the Women of Atelier 17. So we'll be sure to share with you, our audience, more information on, on where you can look up those and other publications. Um, do be sure to visit Labyrinth of Forms at the Whitney Museum. It is open through March 13th, right here in NYC. Um, so please check that out and head to whitney.org to read Sarah's essay on this exhibition. You can also learn more about the exciting exhibitions on view and upcoming from our friends at the Whitney. So uh, to keep up with the league's public programs, subscribe to our email newsletter, follow us on Instagram at ASLNYC. And before you leave tonight, hit that like and subscribe button here on YouTube. Um, Sarah's talk will be available uh, going forward as well. Uh, once again, Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you to those of you who tuned in. I'm Allison Green. We wish you a great rest of your evening. And as always, stay healthy.